Ingersoll's Lecture on Hell, Part 2 of 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ingersoll's Lecture on Hell, Part 2, from the book Lectures of Colonel R. G. Ingersoll. Does the Bible teach you freedom of religion? Today we say that every man has a right to worship God or not, to worship him as he pleases. Is it the doctrine of the Bible? Let us see. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. But thou shalt surely kill him, thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people." and thou shalt stone him with stones that he die, because he has sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Deuteronomy 13, 6 through 10. And do you know, according to that, if your wife, your wife that you love as your own soul, if you had lived in Palestine, and your wife had said to you, Let us worship a sun whose golden beams clothe the world in glory. Let us worship the sun. Let us bow to that great luminary. I love the sun, because it gave me your face, because it gave me the features of my babe. Let us worship the sun. It was then your duty to lay your hands upon her. Your eye must not pity her, but it was your duty to cast the first stone against that tender and loving breast. I hate such doctrine. I hate such books. I hate gods that will write such books. I tell you that it is infamous. If there be found among you within any of thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God, in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded, and it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold it be true, and the thing certain, that such abomination is wrought in Israel, then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman, which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shalt stone them with stones till they die. Deuteronomy 17, 2-5 that is the religious liberty of the Bible. That's it. And this God taught that doctrine to the Jews, and said to them, Any one that teaches a different religion, kill him. Now let me ask, and I want to do it reverently, if, as is contended, God gave these frightful laws to the flesh, and come among the Jews, and taught a different religion, and these Jews, in accordance with the laws which this same God gave them, crucified him, did he not reap what he had sown? The mercy of all this comes in what is called the plan of salvation. What is that plan? According to this great plan, the innocent suffer for the guilty to satisfy a law. What sort of law must it be that would be satisfied with the suffering of innocence? According to this plan, the salvation of the whole world depends upon the bigotry of the Jews and the treachery of Judas. According to the same plan, we all would have gone to eternal hell. According to the same plan, there would have been no death in the world if there had been no sin, and if there had been no death, you and I would not have been called into existence, and if we did not exist, we could not have been saved, so we owe our salvation to the bigotry of the Jews and the treachery of Judas, 
and we are indebted to the devil for our existence. I speak this reverently. It strikes me that what they call the atonement is a kind of moral bankruptcy. Under its merciful provisions man is allowed the privilege of sinning credit, and whenever he is guilty of a mean action he says, charge it. In my judgment, this kind of bookkeeping breeds extravagance in sin. Suppose we had a law in New York that every merchant should give credit to every man who asked it, under pain and penitentiary, and that every man should take the benefit of the bankruptcy statute any Saturday night. Doesn't the credit system in morals breed extravagance in sin? That's the question. Who's afraid of punishment which is so far away? Whom does the doctrine of hell stop? The great? The rich? The powerful? No. The poor? The weak? The despised? The mean? Did you ever hear of a man going to hell who died in New York worth a million of dollars, or with an income of twenty-five thousand a year? Did you? Did you ever hear of a man going to hell who rode in a carriage? Never. They are the gentlemen who talk about their assets, and who say, Hell is not for me, it is for the poor. I have all the luxuries I want. Give that to the poor. Who goes to hell? Tramps. Let me tell you a story. There was once a frightful rain, and all the animals held a convention to see whose fault it was, and the fox nominated the lion for chairman. The wolf seconded the motion, and the hyena said, That suits. When the convention was called to order, the fox was called upon to confess his sins. He stated, however, that it would be much more appropriate for the lion to commence first. Thereupon the lion said, I am not conscious of having committed evil. It is true I have devoured a few men, but for what other purpose were men made? And they all cheered and were satisfied. The fox gave his views upon the goose question, and the wolf admitted that he had devoured sheep, and occasionally had killed a shepherd. But all acquainted with the history of my family will bear me out when I say that shepherds have been the enemies of my family from the beginning of the world. Then way in the rear there arose a simple donkey, with a kind of Abrahamic countenance. He said, I expect it's me. I had eaten nothing for three days except three thistles. I was passing a monastery. The monks were at mass. The gates were opened, leading to a yard full of sweet clover. I knew it was wrong, but I did slip in and took a mouthful. But my conscience smote me, and I went out. And all the animals shouted, He's the fellow! And in two minutes they had his hide on the fence. That's the kind of people that go to hell. Now this doctrine of hell that has been such a comfort to my race, which so many ministers are pleading for, has been defended for ages by the fathers of the church. Your preacher says that the sovereignty of God implies that he has an absolute, unlimited, and independent right to dispose of his creatures as he will, because he made them. Has he? Suppose I take this book and change it immediately into a servient human being. Would I have a right to torture it because I made it? No. On the contrary, I would say, having brought you into existence, it is my duty to do the best for you I can. They say God has a right to damn me because he made me. I deny it. Another one says God is not obliged to save even those who believe in Christ, and that he can either bestow salvation upon his children, or retain it without any diminution of his glory. Another one says God may save any sinner whatsoever, consistently with his justice. Let a natural person, and I claim to be one, Moral or immoral, wise or unwise, let him be as just as he can, no matter what his prayers be, what pains he may have taken to be saved, or whatever circumstances he may be in. God, according to this writer, can deny him salvation, without the least disparagement of his glory. 
His glories will not be in the least obscured. There is no natural man, be his character what it may, but God may cast down to hell without being charged with unfair dealing in any respect with regard to that man. Theologians tell us that God's design in the creation was simply to glorify himself. Magnificent object! The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Revelations 14, 1 through 10. Do you know, nobody would have had an idea of hell in this world if it hadn't been for volcanoes. They were looked upon as the chimneys of hell. The idea of eternal fire never would have polluted the imagination of man but for them. An eminent theologian describing hell says, There is no recounting the millions of ages a damned shall suffer. All arithmetic ends here, and all sense too. They shall have nothing to do in passing away this eternity, but to conflict with torments. God shall have no other use or employment for them. These words were said by gentlemen who died Christians, and who are now in the harp business in the world to come. Another declares there is nothing to keep any man or Christian out of hell except the mere pleasure of God and their pains never grow any easier by their becoming accustomed to them. It is also declared that the devil goes about like a lion, ready to doom the wicked. Did it never occur to you what a contradiction it is to say that the devil will persecute his own friends? He wants all the recruits he can get. Why then should he persecute his friends? In my judgment, he should give them the best hell affords. It is in the very nature of things that torments inflicted have no tendency to bring a wicked man to repentance. Then why torment him if it will not do him good? It is simply unadulterated revenge. All the punishment in the world will not reform a man unless he knows that he who inflicts it upon him does it for the sake of reformation, and really and truly loves him and has his good at heart. Punishment inflicted for gratifying the appetite makes man afraid, but debases him. Various reasons are given for punishing the wicked. First, that God will vindicate his injured majesty. Well, I am glad of that. Second, he will glorify his justice. Think of that. Third, he will show and glorify his grace. Every time the saved shall look upon the damned in hell, it will cause in them a lively and admiring sense of the grace of God. Every look upon the damned will double the ardor and the joy of the saints in heaven. Can the believing husband in heaven look down upon the torments of the unbelieving wife in hell, and then feel a thrill of joy? That's the old doctrine, not of our days. We are too civilized for that. Oh, but it is the doctrine that if you saw your wife in hell, the wife you love, who in your last sickness nursed you, that perhaps supported you by her needle when you were ill, the wife who watched by your couch night and day, and held your corpse in her loving arms when you were dead, the sight would give you great joy. That doctrine is not preached today. They do not preach that the sight would give you joy but they do preach that it will not diminish your happiness. That is the doctrine of every orthodox minister in New York, and I repeat that I have no respect for men who preach such doctrines. The sight of the torments of the damned in hell will increase the ecstasy of the saints forever. On this principle, man never enjoys a good dinner so much as when a fellow creature is dying of famine before his eyes, or he never enjoys the cheerful warmth of his own fireside so greatly as when a poor and abandoned wretch is dying on his doorstep. The saints enjoy the ecstasy, and the groans of the tormented are music to them. 
I say here tonight that you cannot commit a sin against an infinite being. I can sin against my brother or my neighbor because I can injure them. There can be no sin where there is no injury. Neither can a finite being commit infinite sin. An old saint believed that hell was in the interior of the earth, and that the rotation of the earth was caused by the souls trying to get away from the fire. The old church at Stratford-on-Avon, Shakespeare's home, is adorned with pictures of hell and the like. One of the pictures represents resurrection morning. People are getting out of their graves, and devils are catching hold of their heels. In one place there is a huge brass monster, and devils are driving scores of lost souls into his mouth. Over hot fires hang cauldrons with fifty or sixty people in each, and devils are poking the fires. People are hung up on hooks by their tongues, and devils are lashing them. Up in the right-hand corner are some of the saved, with grins on their faces stretching from ear to ear. They seem to say, Aha! What did I tell you? Some of the old saints, gentlemen who died in the odor of sanctity, and are now in the harp business, insisted that heaven and hell would be plainly in view of each other. Only a few years ago, Reverend J. Furness, an appropriate name, published a little pamphlet called A Sight in Hell. I remember when I first read that. My little child, seven years old, was ill and in bed. I thought she would not hear me, and I read some of it aloud. She arose and asked, Who says that? I answered, That's what they preach in some of the churches. I never will enter a church as long as I live, she said, and she never has. The doctrine of orthodox Christianity is that the damned shall suffer torment forever and ever, and if you were a wanderer, footsore, weary, with parched tongue, dying for a drop of water, and you met one who divided his poor portion with you, and died as he saw you reviving, if he was an unbeliever, and you a believer, and you died and went to heaven, and he called to you from hell for a draught of water, it would be your duty to laugh at him. Reverend Mr. Spurgeon says that everywhere in hell will be written the words, For ever. They will be branded on every wave of flame. They will be forged in every link of every chain. They will be seen in every lurid flash of brimstone. Everywhere will be those words, For ever. Everybody will be yelling and screaming them. Just think of that picture of the mercy and justice of the Eternal Father of us all. If these words are necessary, why are they not written now, everywhere in the world, on every tree and every field, and on every blade of grass? I say I am entitled to have it so. I say that it is God's duty to furnish me with the evidence. Here is another good book read in every Sunday school, a splendid book, Pollock's Course of Time. Every copy in the world of such books as that ought to be burned. Well, the author pretends to have gone to hell, and I think that he ought to have stopped there. The lecturer read the passage from the work descriptive of the torments of the damned, and proceeded. And that book is put into the hands of children in order that they may love and worship the most merciful God. In old time they had to find a place for hell, and they found a hundred places for it. One says that it was under Lake Avernus, but the Christians thought differently. One divine tells us that it must be below the earth, because Christ descended into hell. Another gives it as his opinion that hell is in the sun, and he tells us that nobody without an express revelation from God can prove that it is not there. Most likely. Well, he had the idea, at all events, of utilizing the damned as fuel to warm the earth. But I will quote from another poet, if it is lawful to call him a poet. I mean Tupper. Colonel Ingersoll quoted from that orthodox author, and continued. Another divine preached a sermon no further back than 1876, in which he said that the damned will grow worse, and the same divine says that the devil was the first universalist. 
then I am on the side of the devil. The fact is that you have got not merely to believe the Bible, but you must also believe in a certain interpretation of it. And, mind you, you must also believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. I want to explain what that is, so that you may never have an excuse for not knowing it. I quote from the best theologian that ever wrote. Then he went on to give in substance the Athanasian definition of the Trinity, winding up with a long string of adjectives, culminating in the description, entirely incomprehensible. If you don't understand it after that, it is your own fault. Now you must believe in that doctrine. If you do not, all the orthodox churches agree in condemning you to everlasting flames. We have got to burn through all our lives simply with the view of making them happy. We are taught to love our enemies, to pray for those that persecute us, to forgive. Should not the merciful God practice what he preaches? I say that reverently. Why should he say forgive your enemies if he will not himself forgive? Why should he say, pray for those that despise and persecute you, but if they refuse to believe his doctrine, he will burn them forever? I cannot believe it. Here is a little child residing in the purlieus of the city, some boy who is taught that it is his duty to steal by his mother, who applauds his success and pats him on the head and calls him a good boy. Would it be just to condemn him to an eternity of torture? Suppose there is a God. Let us bring to this question some common sense. I care nothing about the doctrines of religions or creeds of the past. Let us come to the bar of the nineteenth century and judge matter by what we know, by what we think, by what we love. But they say to us, if you throw away the Bible, what are we to depend on then? But no two persons in the world agree as to what the Bible is, what they are to believe, and what they are not to believe. It is like a guidepost that has been thrown down in some time of disaster, and has been put up the wrong way. Nobody can accept its guidance, for nobody knows where it would direct him. I say, tear down the useless guidepost. But they answer, oh, do not do that, or we will have nothing to go by. I would say, old church, you take that road, and I will take this. Another minister has said that the Bible is the great town clock, at which we all may set our watches. But I have said to a friend of that minister, suppose we all should set our watches by that town clock. There would be many persons to tell you that in old times the long hand was the hour hand, and besides, the clock hasn't been wound up for a long time. I say, let us wait till the sun rises and set our watches by nature. For my part, I am willing to give up heaven, to get rid of hell. I had rather there should be no heaven than that any solitary soul should be condemned to suffer forever and ever." but they tell me that the Bible is the good book. Now in the Old Testament there is not, in my judgment, a single reference to another life. Is there a burial service mentioned in it in which a word of hope is spoken at the grave of the dead? The idea of eternal life was not born of any book. That wave of hope and joy ebbs and flows, and will continue to ebb and flow, as long as love kisses the lips of death. Let me tell you a tale of the Persian religion, of a man who, having done good for long years of his life, presented himself at the gates of paradise, but the gates remained closed against him. He went back and followed up his good works for seven years longer, and the gates of paradise still remained shut against him. He toiled in works of charity until at last they were opened unto him. Think of that, pursued the lecturer, and send out your missionaries among those people. There is no religion but goodness, but justice, but charity. Religion is not theory, it is life. It is not intellectual conviction, it is divine humanity, and nothing else. 
Colonel Ingersoll here told another tale from the Hindu, of a man who refused to enter paradise without a faithful dog, urging that ingratitude was the blackest of all sins. And the God, he said, admitted him, dog and all. Compare that religion with the orthodox tenets of the city of New York. There is a prayer which every Brahmin prays, in which he declares that he will never enter into a final state of bliss alone, but that everywhere he will strive for universal redemption, that never will he leave the world of sin and sorrow, but remain suffering and striving and sorrowing after universal salvation. Compare that with the orthodox idea, and send out your missionaries to the benighted Hindus. The doctrine of hell is infamous, beyond all power to express. I wish there were words mean enough to express my feelings of loathing on this subject. What harm has it not done? What waste places has it not made? It has planted misery and wretchedness in this world. It peoples the future with selfish joys and lurid abysses of eternal flame. But we are getting more sense every day. We begin to despise those monstrous doctrines. If you want to better men and women, change their conditions here. Don't promise them something somewhere else. One biscuit will do more good than all the tracts that were ever peddled in the world. Give them more whitewash, more light, more air. You have to change men physically before you change them intellectually. I believe the time will come when every criminal will be treated as we now treat the diseased and sick, when every penitentiary will become a reformatory, and that if criminals go to them with hatred in their bosoms, they will leave them without feelings of revenge. Let me tell you the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Eurydice had been carried away by the god of hell, and Orpheus, her lover, went in quest of her. He took with him his lyre, and played such exquisite music that all hell was amazed. Ixion forgot his labors at the wheel. The daughters of Danaeus ceased from their hopeless task. Tantalus forgot his thirst. Even Pluto smiled. And for the first time in the history of hell, the eyes of the Furies were wet with tears. As it was with the lyre of Orpheus, so it is today with the great harmonies of science, which are rescuing from the prisons of superstition the torn and bleeding heart of man. End of Ingersoll's Lecture on Hell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. This is the third lecture from Lectures of Colonel R. G. Ingersoll, read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during May 2007. Saul's Lecture on Individuality. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll. Lecture number four Ingersoll's Lecture on Individuality An Arraignment of the Church. His soul was like a star, and dwelt apart. On every hand are the enemies of individuality and mental freedom. Custom meets us at the cradle, and leaves us only at the tomb. Our first questions are answered by ignorance, and our last by superstition. We are pushed and dragged by countless hands along the beaten track, and our entire training can be summed up in the word suppression. Our desire to have a thing or to do a thing is considered as conclusive evidence that we ought to do it. At every turn we run not to have it, and ought not against a cherubim and a flaming sword, guarding some entrance to the Eden of our desire. We are allowed to investigate all subjects in which we feel no particular interest, and to express the opinions of the majority with the utmost freedom. 
we are taught that liberty of speech should never be carried to the extent of contradicting the dead witnesses of a popular superstition society offers continual rewards for self-betrayal and they are nearly all earned and claimed and some are paid we have all read accounts of christian gentlemen remarking when about to be hanged how much better it would have been for them if they had only followed a mother's advice but after all how fortunate it is for the world that the maternal advice has not been followed how lucky it is for us all that it is somewhat unnatural for a human being to obey universal obedience is universal stagnation disobedience is one of the conditions of progress select any age of the world and tell me what would have been the effect of implicit obedience suppose the church had had absolute control of the human mind at any time would not the word liberty and progress have been blotted from the human speech in defiance of advice the world has advanced suppose the astronomers had controlled the science of astronomy suppose the doctors had controlled the science of medicine suppose kings had been left to fix the form of government suppose our fathers had taken the advice of paul who was subject to the powers that be because they are ordained of god suppose the church could control the world today we would go back to chaos and old night philosophy would be branded as infamous science would again press its pale and thoughtful face against the prison bars and round the limbs of liberty would climb the bigot's flame it is a blessed thing that in every age someone has had individuality enough and courage enough to stand by his own convictions someone who had the grit to say his say i believe it was magellan who said the church says the earth is flat but i have seen its shadow on the moon and i have more confidence even in a shadow than in the church on the prow of his ship were disobedience defiance scorn and success the trouble with most people is that they bow to what is called authority they have a certain reverence for the old because it is old they think a man is better for being dead especially if he has been dead a long time and that the forefathers of their nation were the greatest and best of all mankind all these things they implicitly believe because it is popular and patriotic and because they were told so when very small and remember distinctly of hearing mother read it out of a book and they are all willing to swear that mother was a good woman it is hard to overestimate the influence of early training in the direction of superstition you first teach children that a certain book is true that it was written by god himself that to question its truth is sin and to deny it is a crime and that should they die without believing that book they will be forever damned without benefit of clergy the consequence is that before they read that book they believe it to be true when they do read their minds are wholly unfitted to investigate its claim they accept it as a matter of course in this way reason is overcome the sweet instincts of humanity are blotted from the heart and while reading its infamous pages even justice throws aside her scales shrieking for revenge and charity with bloody hands applauds a deed of murder in this way we are taught that the revenge of man is the justice of god that mercy is not the same everywhere in this way the ideas of our race have been subverted in this way we have made tyrants bigots and inquisitors in this way the brain of man has become a kind of palimpsest upon which and over the writings of nature superstition has scribbled her countless lies 
our great trouble is that most teachers are dishonest they teach as certainties those things concerning which they entertain doubts they do not say we think this is so but we know this is so they do not appeal to the reason of the pupil but they command his faith they keep all doubts to themselves they do not explain they assert all this is infamous in this way you make christians but you cannot make men you cannot make women you can make followers but no leaders disciples but no christs you may promise power honor and happiness to all those who will blindly follow but you cannot keep your promise an eastern monarch said to a hermit come with me and i will give you power i have all the power that i know how to use replied the hermit come said the king i will give you wealth i have no wants that money can supply i will give you honor ah honor cannot be given it must be earned come said the king making a last appeal and i will give you happiness no said the man of solitude there is no happiness without liberty and he who follows cannot be free you shall have your liberty too then i will stay and all the king's courtiers thought the hermit a fool now and then somebody examines and in spite of all keeps up his manhood and has courage to follow where his reason leads then the pious get together and repeat wise saws and exchange knowing nods and most prophetic winks the stupidly wise sit owl-like on the dead limbs of the tree of knowledge and solemnly hoot wealth sneers and fashion laughs and respectability passes on the other side and scorn points with all her skinny fingers and like the snakes of superstition writhe and hiss and slander lends her tongue and infamy her brand perjury her oath and the law its power and bigotry tortures and the church kills the church hates a thinker precisely for the same reason that a robber dislikes a sheriff or that a thief despises the prosecuting witness tyranny likes courtiers flatterers followers fawners and superstition wants believers disciples zealots hypocrites and subscribers the church demands worship the very thing that man should give to no being human or divine to worship another is to degrade yourself worship is awe and dread and vague fear and blind hope it is the spirit of worship that elevates the one and degrades the many and manacles even its own hands the spirit of worship is the spirit of tyranny the worshipper always regrets that he is not the worshipped we should all remember that the intellect has no knees and that whatever the attitude of the body may be the brave soul is always found erect whoever worships abdicates whoever believes at the commands of power tramples his own individuality beneath his feet and voluntarily robs himself of all that renders man superior to brute the despotism of faith is justified upon the ground that christian countries are the grandest and most prosperous of the world at one time the same thing could have been truly said in india in egypt in greece in rome and in every other country that has in the history of the world swept to empire this argument proves too much not only but the assumption upon which it is based is utterly false numberless circumstances and countless conditions have produced the prosperity of the christian world the truth is that we have advanced in spite of religious zeal ignorance and opposition the church has won no victories for the rights of man over every fortress of tyranny has waved and still waves the banner of the church wherever brave blood has been shed the sword of the church has been wet 
on every chain has been the sign of the cross the altar and the throne have leaned against and supported each other who can appreciate the infinite impudence of one man assuming to think for others who can imagine the impudence of a church that threatens to inflict eternal punishment upon those who honestly reject its claims and scorn its pretensions in the presence of the unknown we have all an equal right to guess over the vast plain called life we are all travelers and not one traveler is perfectly certain that he is going in the right direction true it is that no other plain is so well supplied with guide-boards at every turn and crossing you find them and upon each one is written the exact direction and distance one great trouble is however that these boards are all different and the result is that most travelers are confused in proportion to the number they read thousands of people are around each of these signs and each one is doing his best to convince the traveler that his particular board is the only one upon which the least reliance can be placed and that if his road is taken the reward for so doing will be infinite and eternal while all the other roads are said to lead to hell and all the makers of the other guide boards are declared to be heretics hypocrites and liars well says a traveller you may be right in what you say but allow me at least to read some of the other directions and examine a little into their claims i wish to rely a little upon my own judgment in a matter of such great importance no sir shouts the zealot that is the very thing you are not allowed to do you must go my way without investigation or you are as good as damned already well says the traveller if that is so i believe i had better go your way and so most of them go along taking the word of those who know as little as themselves now and then comes one who in spite of all threats calmly examines the claims of all and as calmly rejects them all these travellers take roads of their own and are denounced by all the others as infidels and atheists in my judgment every human being should take a road of his own every mind should be true to itself should think investigate and conclude for itself this is a duty alike incumbent upon pauper and prince every soul should repel dictation and tyranny no matter from what source they come from earth or heaven from men or gods besides every traveller upon this vast plain should give to every other traveller his best idea as to the road that should be taken each is entitled to the honest opinion of all and there is but one way to get an honest opinion upon any subject whatever the person giving the opinion must be free from fear the merchant must not fear to lose his custom the doctor his practice nor the preacher his pulpit there can be no advance without liberty suppression of honest inquiry is retrogression and must end in intellectual night the tendency of orthodox religion today is towards mental slavery and barbarism not one of the orthodox ministers dare preach what he thinks if he knows that a majority of his congregation think otherwise he knows that every member of his church stands guard over his brain with a creed like a club in his hand he knows that he is not expected to search after the truth but that he is employed to defend the creed every pulpit is a pillory in which stands a hired culprit defending the justice of his own imprisonment is it desirable that all should be exactly alike in their religious convictions is any such thing possible do we not know that there are no two persons alike in the whole world no two trees no two leaves no two anythings that are alike infinite diversity is the law religion tries to force all minds into one mold 
Knowing that all cannot believe, the church endeavors to make all say that they believe. She longs for the unity of hypocrisy, and detests the splendid diversity of individuality and freedom. Nearly all people stand in great horror of annihilation, and yet to give up your individuality is to annihilate yourself. Mental slavery is mental death, and every man who has given up his intellectual freedom is the living coffin of his dead soul. In this sense, every church is a cemetery, and every creed an epitaph. We should all remember that to be like other folks is to be unlike ourselves, and that nothing can be more detestable in character than servile imitation. The great trouble with imitation is that we are apt to ape those who are in reality far below us. After all, the poorest bargain that a human being can make is to trade off his individuality for what is called respectability. There is no saying more degrading than this. It is better to be the tail of a lion than the head of a dog. It is a responsibility to think and act for yourself. Most people hate responsibility. Therefore, they join something and become the tail of some lion. They say, my party can act for me. My church can do my thinking. It is enough for me to pay taxes and obey the lion to which I belong, without troubling myself about the right, the wrong, or the why or the wherefore of anything whatever. These people are respectable. They hate reformers and dislike exceedingly to have their minds disturbed. They regard convictions as very disagreeable things to have. They love forms, and enjoy beyond everything else telling what a splendid tail their lion has, and what a troublesome dog their neighbor is. Besides this natural inclination, to avoid personal responsibility is, and always has been the fact, that every religionist has warned men against the presumption and wickedness of thinking for themselves. The reason has been denounced by all Christendom as the only unsafe guide. The church has left nothing undone to prevent man following the logic of his brain, the plainest facts have been covered with the mantle of mystery. The grossest absurdities have been declared to be self-evident facts. The order of nature has been, as it were, reversed, in order that the hypocritical few might govern the honest many. The man who stood by the conclusion of his reason was denounced as a scorner and hater of God and his holy church. From the organization of the first church until this moment, every member has borne the marks of collar and chain and whip. No man ever seriously attempted to reform a church without being cast out and hunted down by the hounds of hypocrisy. The highest crime against a creed is to change it. Reformation is treason. Thousands of young men are being educated at this moment by the various churches. What for? In order that they may be prepared to investigate the phenomena by which we are surrounded? No. The object and the only object is that they may be prepared to defend a creed, that they may learn the arguments of their respective churches and repeat them in the dull ears of a thoughtless congregation. If one, after being thus trained at the expense of the Methodists, turns Presbyterian or Baptist, he is denounced as an ungrateful wretch. Honest investigation is utterly impossible within the pale of any church, for the reason that if you think the church is right, you will not investigate, and if you think it wrong, the church will investigate you. The consequence of this is that most of the theological literature is the result of suppression, of fear, of tyranny, and hypocrisy. Every orthodox writer necessarily said to himself, If I write that, my wife and children may want for bread. I will be covered with shame and branded with infamy. But if I write this, I will gain position, power, and honor. My church rewards defenders 
and burns reformers under these conditions all your scots henrys and mcknights have written and weighed in these scales what are their commentaries worth they are not the ideas and decisions of honest judges but the sophisms of the paid attorneys of superstition who can tell what the world has lost by this infamous system of suppression how many grand thinkers died with the mailed hand of superstition on their lips how many splendid ideas have perished in the cradle of the brain strangled in the poisonous coils of that python the church for thousands of years a thinker was hunted down like an escaped convict to him who had braved the church every door was shut every knife was open to shelter him from the wild storm to give him a crust of bread when dying to put a cup of water to his cracked and bleeding lips these were all crimes not one of which the church ever did forgive and with the justice taught of god his helpless children were exterminated as scorpions and vipers who at the present day can imagine the courage the devotion to principle the intellectual and moral grandeur it once required to be an infidel to brave the church her racks her faggots her dungeons her tongues of fire to defy and scorn her heaven and her devil and her god they were the noblest sons of earth they were the real saviors of our race the destroyers of superstition and the creators of science they were the real titans who bared their grand foreheads to all the thunderbolts of all the gods the church has been and still is the great robber she has rifled not only the pockets but the brains of the world she is the stone at the sepulchre of liberty the upas tree in whose shade the intellect of man has withered the gorgon beneath whose gaze the human heart has turned to stone under her influence even the protestant mother expects to be in heaven while her brave boy who is fighting for the rights of man shall writhe in hell it is said that some of the indian tribes placed the heads of their children between pieces of bark until the form of the skull is permanently changed to us this seems a most shocking custom and yet after all is it as bad as to put the souls of our children in the straitjacket of a creed to so utterly deform their minds that they regard the god of the bible as a being of infinite mercy and really consider it a virtue to believe a thing just because it seems unreasonable every child in the christian world has uttered its wondering protest against this outrage all the machinery of the church is constantly employed in thus corrupting the reason of children in every possible way they are robbed of their own thoughts and forced to accept the statements of others every sunday school has for its object the crushing out of every germ of individuality the poor children are taught that nothing can be more acceptable to god than unreasoning obedience and eyeless faith and that to believe that god did an impossible act is far better than to do a good one yourself they are told that all the religions have been simply the john the baptist of ours that all the gods of antiquity have withered and sunken into the jehovah of the jews that all the longings and aspirations of the race are realized in the motto of the evangelical alliance liberty in non-essentials that all there is or ever was of religion can be found in the apostles creed that there is nothing left to be discovered that all the thinkers are dead and all the living should simply be believers that we have only to repeat the epitaph found on the grave of wisdom that graveyards are the best possible universities and that the children must be forever beaten with the bones of the father it has always seemed absurd to suppose that a god would choose for his companions during all eternity 
the dear souls whose highest and only ambition is to obey he certainly would now and then be tempted to make the same remark made by an english gentleman to his poor guest this gentleman had invited a man in humble circumstances to dine with him the man was so overcome with honor that to everything the gentleman said he replied yes tired at last with the monotony of acquiescence the gentleman cried out for god's sake my good man say no just once so there will be two of us is it possible that an infinite god created this world simply to be the dwelling-place of slaves and serfs simply for the purpose of raising orthodox christians that he did a few miracles to astonish them that all the evils of life are simply his punishments and that he is finally going to turn heaven into a kind of religious museum filled with baptist barnacles petrified presbyterians and methodist mummies i want no heaven for which i must give my reason no happiness in exchange for my liberty and no immortality that demands the surrender of my individuality better rot in the windowless tomb to which there is no door but the red mouth of the pallid worm than wear the jewelled collar even of a god religion does not and cannot contemplate man as free she accepts only the homage of the prostrate and scorns the offerings of those who stand erect she cannot tolerate the liberty of thought the wide and sunny fields belong not to her domain the starlit heights of genius and individuality are above and beyond her appreciation and power her subjects cringe at her feet, covered with the dust of obedience. They are not athletes, standing posed by rich life and brave endeavor like the antique statues, but shriveled deformities, studying with furtive glance the cruel face of power. No religionist seems capable of comprehending this plain truth. There is this difference between thought and action for our actions we are responsible to ourselves and to those injuriously affected for thoughts there can in the nature of things be no responsibility to gods or men here or hereafter and yet the protestant has vied with the catholic in denouncing freedom of thought and while i was taught to hate catholicism with every drop of my blood it is only justice to say that in all essential particulars it is precisely the same as every other religion luther denounced mental liberty with all the coarse and brutal vigor of his nature calvin despised from the very bottom of his petrified heart anything that even looked like religious toleration and solemnly declared to advocate it was to crucify christ afresh all the founders of all the orthodox churches have advocated the same infamous tenet the truth is that what is called religion is necessarily inconsistent with free thought a believer is a songless bird in a cage a free thinker is an eagle parting the clouds with tireless wings at present owing to the inroads that have been made by liberals and infidels most of the churches pretend to be in favor of religious liberty of these churches we will ask this question how can a man who conscientiously believes in religious liberty worship a god who does not they say to us we will not imprison you on account of your belief but our god will we will not burn you because you throw away the sacred scriptures but their author will we think it an infamous crime to persecute our brethren for opinion's sake but the god whom we ignorantly worship will on that account damn his own children for ever why is it that these christians do not only detest the infidels but so cordially despise each other why do they refuse to worship in the temples of each other why do they care so little for the damnation of men and so much for the baptism of children why will they adorn their churches with the money of thieves and flatter vice for the sake of subscription why will they attempt to bribe science to certify to the writings of god why do they torture the words of the great into an acknowledgment of the truth of christianity 
why do they stand with hat in hand before presidents kings emperors and scientists begging like lazarus for a few crumbs of religious comfort why are they so delighted to find an allusion to providence in the message of lincoln why are they so afraid that someone will find out that Paley wrote an essay in favor of the Epicurean philosophy, and that Sir Isaac Newton was once an infidel? Why are they so anxious to show that Voltaire recanted, that Paine died palsied with fear, that the Emperor Julian cried out, Galilean thou hast conquered, that Gibbon died a Catholic, that Agassiz had a little confidence in Moses, that the old Napoleon was once complimentary enough to say that he thought Christ greater than himself or Caesar, that Washington was caught on his knees at Valley Forge, that blunt old Ethan Allen told his child to believe the religion of her mother, that Franklin said, Don't unchain the tiger that Volney got frightened in a storm at sea, and that Oakes Ames was a wholesale liar. Is it because the foundation of their temple is crumbling, because the walls are cracked, the pillars leaning, the great dome swaying to its fall, and because science has written over the high altar its mene mene tekel upharsin, the old words destined to be the epitaph of all religions? every assertion of individual independence has been a step towards infidelity luther started toward humboldt wesley toward bradlaugh to really reform the church is to destroy it every new religion has a little less superstition than the old so that the religion of science is but a question of time i will not say the church has been an unmitigated evil in all respects its history is infamous and glorious. It has delighted in the production of extremes. It has furnished murderers for its own martyrs. It has sometimes fed the body, but has always starved the soul. It has been a charitable highwayman, a generous pirate. It has produced some angels and a multitude of devils. It has built more prisons than asylums. It made a hundred orphans while it cared for one. In one hand it carried the alms dish, and in the other a sword. It has founded schools and endowed universities for the purpose of destroying true learning. It filled the world with hypocrites and zealots, and upon the cross of its own Christ it crucified the individuality of man. It has sought to destroy the independence of the soul, and put the world upon its knees. This is the crime. The commission of this crime was necessary to its existence. In order to compel obedience, it declared that it had the truth and all the truth, that God had made it the keeper of all his secrets, his agent and his vice-agent. It declared that all other religions were false and infamous. It rendered all compromises impossible, and all thought superfluous. Thought was an enemy. Obedience was its friend. Investigation was fraught with danger. Therefore, investigation was suppressed. The holy of holies was behind the curtain. All this was upon the principle that forgers hate to have the signature examined by an expert, and that imposture detests curiosity. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear, has always been one of the favorite texts of the church. In short, Christianity has always opposed every forward movement of the human race. Across the highway of progress it has always been building breastworks of Bibles, tracts, commentaries, prayer books, creeds, dogmas, and platforms and at every advance the Christians have gathered behind these heaps of rubbish and shot the poisoned arrows of malice at the soldiers of freedom. And even the liberal Christian of today has his holy of holies, and in the niche of the temple of his heart has his idol. He still clings to a part of the old superstition, and all the pleasant memories of the old belief linger in the horizon of his thoughts like a sunset. We associate the memory of those we love 
with the religion of our childhood it seems almost a sacrilege to rudely destroy the idols that our fathers worshipped and turn their sacred and beautiful truths into the silly fables of barbarism some throw away the old testament and cling to the new while others give up everything except the idea that there is a personal god and that in some wonderful way we are the objects of his care even this in my opinion as science the great iconoclast marches onward will have to be abandoned with the rest the great ghost will surely share the fate of the little ones they fled at the first appearance of the dawn and the other will vanish with the perfect day until then the independence of man is little more than a dream overshadowed by an immense personality in the presence of the irresponsible and the infinite the individuality of man is lost and he falls prostrate in the very dust of fear beneath the frown of the absolute man stands a wretched trembling slave beneath his smile he is at best only a fortunate serf governed by a being whose arbitrary will is law chained to the chariot of power his destiny rests in the pleasure of the unknown under these circumstances what wretched object can he have in lengthening out his aimless life and yet in most minds there is a vague fear of what the gods may do and the safe side is considered the best side a gentleman walking among the ruins of athens came upon a fallen statue of jupiter making an exceedingly low bow he said jupiter i salute thee he then added should you ever get up in the world again do not forget i pray you that i treated you politely while you were prostrate <laughs> We all have been taught by the church that nothing is so well calculated to excite the ire of the deity as to express a doubt as to his existence, and that to deny it is an unpardonable sin. Numerous well-attested instances were referred to of atheists being struck dead for denying the existence of God. According to these religious people, God is infinitely above us in every respect, infinitely merciful, and yet he cannot bear to hear a poor, finite man honestly question his existence. Knowing as he does that his children are groping in darkness and struggling with doubt and fear, knowing that he could enlighten them if he would, he still holds the expression of a sincere doubt as to his existence the most infamous of crimes according to the orthodox logic god having furnished us with imperfect minds has a right to demand a perfect result suppose mr smith should overhear a couple of small bugs holding a discussion as to the existence of mr smith and suppose one should have the temerity to declare upon the honor of a bug that he had examined the whole question to the best of his ability including the argument based upon design and had come to the conclusion that no man by the name of smith had ever lived think then of mr smith flying into an ecstasy of rage crushing the atheist bug beneath his iron heel while he exclaimed i will teach you blasphemous wretch that smith is a diabolical fact what then can we think of god who would open the artillery of heaven upon one of his own children for simply expressing his honest thought and what man who really thinks can help repeating the words of aeneas if there are gods they certainly pay no attention to the affairs of man in religious ideas and conceptions there has been for ages a slow and steady development at the bottom of the ladder speaking of modern times is catholicism and at the top are atheism and science the intermediate rounds of this ladder are occupied by the various sects whose name is legion but whatever may be the truth on any subject has nothing to do with our right to investigate that subject and express any opinion we may form all that i ask is the right i freely accord to all others a few years ago a methodist clergyman took it upon himself to give me a piece of friendly advice although you may disbelieve the bible said he you ought not to say so that you should keep to yourself do you believe the bible said i 
He replied, Most assuredly, to which I retorted, Your answer conveys no information to me. You may be following your own advice. You told me to suppress my opinions. Of course, a man who will advise others to dissimulate will not always be particular about telling the truth himself. It is the duty of each and every one to maintain his individuality. This, above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. It is a magnificent thing to be the sole proprietor of yourself. It is a terrible thing to wake up at night and say, There is nobody in this bed. It is humiliating to know that your ideas are all borrowed, and that you are indebted to your memory for your principles, that your religion is simply one of your habits, and that you would have convictions if they were only contagious. It is mortifying to feel that you belong to a mental mob and cry, Crucify him, because the others do that you reap what the great and brave have sown, and that you can benefit the world only by leaving it. Surely every human being ought to attain the dignity of the unit. Surely it is worth something to be one, and to feel that the census of the universe would not be complete without counting you. Surely there is grandeur in knowing that in the realm of thought at least you are without a chain, that you have the right to explore all heights and all depths, that there are no walls, fences, prohibited places, nor sacred corners in all the vast expanse of thought, that your intellect owes no allegiance to any being, human or divine that you hold all in fee, and upon no condition and by no tenure whatever, that in the world of mind you are relieved from all personal dictation and from the ignorant tyranny of majorities. Surely it is worth something to feel that there are no priests, no popes, no parties, no governments, no kings, no gods, to whom your intellect can be compelled to pay a reluctant homage. Surely it is a joy to know that all the cruel ingenuity of bigotry can devise no prison, no lock, no cell in which for one instant to confine a thought, that ideas cannot be dislocated by racks, nor crushed in iron boots, nor burned with fire. Surely it is sublime to think that the brain is a castle, and that within its curious bastions and winding halls, the soul, in spite of all worlds and all beings, is the supreme sovereign of itself. End of Ingersoll's Lecture on Individuality This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Ingersoll's Lecture on Individuality is the fourth lecture from the book Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll, read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during May 2007. Ingersoll's Lecture on Humboldt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ingersoll's Lecture on Humboldt Ladies and gentlemen, great minds seem to be a part of the infinite. Those possessing them seem to be brothers of the mountains and the seas. Humboldt was one of these. He was one of the few great enough to rise above the superstition and prejudice of his time, and to know that experience, observation, and reason are the only basis of knowledge. He became one of the greatest of men in spite of having been born rich and noble, in spite of position. I say in spite of these things, because wealth and position are generally the enemies of genius, and the destroyers of talent. It is often said of this or that man that he is a self-made man, that he was born of the poorest and humblest parents, and that with every obstacle to overcome he became great. This is a mistake. 
Poverty is generally an advantage. Most of the intellectual giants of the world have been nursed at the sad but loving breast of poverty. Most of those who have climbed highest on the shining ladder of fame commenced at the lowest round. They were reared in the straw-thatched cottages of Europe, in the log houses of America, in the factories of the great cities, in the midst of toil, in the smoke and din of labor, and on the verge of want. They were rocked by the feet of mothers whose hands, at the same time, were busy with the needle or the wheel. It is hard for the rich to resist the thousand allurements of pleasure, and so I say that Humboldt, in spite of having been born to wealth and high social position, became truly and grandly great. In the antiquated and romantic castle of Tegel, by the side of the pine forest, on the shore of the charming lake, near the beautiful city of Berlin, the great Humboldt, one hundred years ago today, was born, and there he was educated after the method suggested by Rousseau, Campe, the philologist and critic, and the intellectual Kunt being his tutors. There he received the impressions that determined his career. There the great idea that the universe is governed by law took possession of his mind, and there he dedicated his life to the demonstration of this sublime truth. He came to the conclusion that the source of man's unhappiness is his ignorance of nature. He longed to give a physical description of the universe, a grand picture of nature, to account for all phenomena, to discover the laws governing the world, to do away with that splendid delusion called special providence, and to establish the fact that the universe is governed by law. To establish this truth was, and is, of infinite importance to mankind. That fact is the death knell of superstition. It gives liberty to every soul, annihilates fear, and ushers in the age of reason. The object of this illustrious man was to comprehend the phenomena of physical objects in their general connection, and to represent nature as one great whole, moved and animated by internal forces. For this purpose he turned his attention to descriptive botany, traversing distant lands and mountain ranges to ascertain with certainty the geographical distribution of plants. He investigated the laws regulating the differences of temperature and climate and the changes of the atmosphere. He studied the formation of the earth's crust, explored the deepest mines, ascended the highest mountains, and wandered through the craters of extinct volcanoes. He became thoroughly acquainted with chemistry, with astronomy, with terrestrial magnetism and as the investigation of one subject leads to all others for the reason that there is a mutual dependence and a necessary connection between all facts so humboldt became acquainted with all the known sciences his fame does not depend so much upon his discoveries although he discovered enough to make hundreds of reputations as upon his vast and splendid generalizations he was to science what Shakespeare was to drama. He found, so to speak, the world full of unconnected facts, all portions of a vast system, parts of a great machine. He discovered the connection that each bears to all, put them together, and demonstrated beyond all contradiction that the earth is governed by law. He knew that to discover the connection of phenomena is the primary aim of all natural investigation. He was infinitely practical. Origin and destiny were questions with which he had nothing to do. His surroundings made him what he was. In accordance with a law not fully comprehended, he was a production of his time. Great men do not live alone. They are surrounded by the great. They are the instruments used to accomplish the tendencies of their generation. They fulfill the prophecies of their age. Nearly all of the scientific men of the 18th century had the same idea entertained by Humboldt, but most of them in a dim and confused way. 
there was however a general belief among the intelligent that the world is governed by law and that there really exists a connection between all facts or that all facts are simply the different aspects of a general fact and that the task of science is to discover this connection to comprehend this general fact or to announce the laws of things germany was full of thought and her universities swarmed with philosophers and grand thinkers in every department of knowledge humboldt was the friend and companion of the greatest poets historians philologists artists statesmen critics and logicians of his time he was the companion of schiller who believed that man would be regenerated through the influence of the beautiful of goethe the grand patriarch of german literature of weiland who has been called the voltaire of germany of herder who wrote the outlines of a philosophical history of man of kotzebue who lived in the world of romance or schliermacher the pantheist of schlegel who gave to his country the enchanted realm of shakespeare of the sublime kant author of the first work published in germany on pure reason of fichte the infinite idealist of schopenhauer the european buddhist who followed the great gautama to the painless and dreamless nirvana and of hundreds of others whose names are familiar to and honored by the scientific world the german mind had been grandly roused from the long lethargy of the dark ages of ignorance fear and faith guided by the holy light of reason every department of knowledge was investigated enriched and illustrated Humboldt breathed the atmosphere of investigation. Old ideas were abandoned. Old creeds, hallowed by centuries, were thrown aside. Thought became courageous. The athlete, reason, challenged to mortal combat the monsters of superstition. No wonder that under these influences Humboldt formed the great purpose of presenting to the world a picture of nature, in order that men might for the first time behold the face of their mother. Europe becoming too small for his genius, he visited the tropics in the New World, where, in the most circumscribed limits, he could find the greatest number of plants, of animals, and the greatest diversity of climate that he might ascertain the laws governing the production and distribution of plants, animals, and men, and the effects of climate upon them all. He sailed along the gigantic Amazon, the mysterious Orinoco, traversed the Pampas, climbed the Andes, until he stood upon the crags of Chimborazo, more than eighteen thousand feet above the level of the sea, and climbed on until blood flowed from his eyes and lips, for nearly five years he pursued his investigations in the new world accompanied by the intrepid bonpland nothing escaped his attention he was the best intellectual organ of these new revelations of science he was calm reflective and eloquent filled with a sense of the beautiful and the love of truth his collections were immense and valuable beyond calculation to every science he endured innumerable hardships, braved countless dangers in unknown and savage lands, and exhausted his fortune for the advancement of true learning. Upon his return to Europe, he was hailed as the second Columbus, as the scientific discoverer of America, as the revealer of a new world, as the great demonstrator of the sublime truth that universe is governed by law. I have seen a picture of the old man sitting upon a mountainside, above him the eternal snow, below smiling valley of the tropics, filled with vine and palm, his chin upon his breast, his eyes deep, thoughtful, and calm, his forehead majestic, grander than the mountain upon which he sat. Crowned with the snow of his whitened hair, he looked the intellectual autocrat of this world not satisfied with his discoveries in america he crossed the steppes of asia the wastes of siberia the great ural range adding to the knowledge of mankind at every step his energy acknowledged no obstacle his life knew no leisure 
Every day was filled with labor and with thought. He was one of the apostles of science, and he served his divine master with a self-sacrificing zeal that knew no abatement, with an ardor that constantly increased, and with a devotion unwavering and constant as the polar star. In order that the people at large might have the benefit of his numerous discoveries and his vast knowledge, he delivered at Berlin a course of lectures, consisting of sixty-one free addresses, upon the following subjects. Five upon the nature and limits of physical geography, three were devoted to a history of science, two to inducements to a study of natural science, sixteen on the heavens, five on the form, density, latent heat, and magnetic power of the earth, and to the polar light. Four were on the nature of the crust of the earth, on hot springs, earthquakes, and volcanoes, two on mountains, and the type of their formation, two on the form of the earth's surface, on the connection of continents, and the elevation of soil over ravines, three on the sea, as a globular fluid surrounding the earth, ten on the atmosphere, as an elastic fluid surrounding the earth, and on the distribution of heat, one on the geographic distribution of organized matter in general, three on the geography of plants, three on the geography of animals, and two on the races of men. These lectures are what is known as the cosmos, and present a scientific picture of the world, of infinite diversity in unity, of ceaseless motion in the eternal grasp of law. These lectures contain the result of his investigation, observation, and experience. They furnish the connection between phenomena. They disclose some of the changes through which the earth has passed in the countless ages. The history of vegetation, animals, and men. The effects of climate upon individuals and nations the relation we sustain to other worlds, and demonstrate that all phenomena, whether insignificant or grand, exist in accordance with inexorable law. There are some truths, however, that we never should forget. Superstition has always been the relentless enemy of science. Faith has been a hater of demonstration. Hypocrisy has been sincere only in its dread of truth and all religions are inconsistent with mental freedom. Since the murder of Hypatia in the fifth century, when the polished blade of Greek philosophy was broken by the club of ignorant Catholicism, until today, superstition has detested every effort of reason. It is almost impossible to conceive of the completeness of the victory that the Church achieved over philosophy. For ages science was utterly ignored. Thought was a poor slave. An ignorant priest was master of the world. Faith put out the eyes of the soul. The reason was a trembling coward. The imagination was set on fire of hell. Every human feeling was sought to be suppressed. Love was considered infinitely sinful. Pleasure was the road to eternal fire, and God was supposed to be happy only when his children were miserable. The world was governed by an almighty's whim. Prayers could change the order of things, halt the grand procession of nature, could produce rain, avert pestilence, famine, and death in all its forms. There was no idea of the certain, all depended upon divine pleasure, or displeasure, rather. Heaven was full of inconsistent malevolence, and earth of ignorance. Everything was done to appease the divine wrath. Every public calamity was caused by the sins of the people, by a failure to pay tithes, or for having, even in secret, felt a disrespect for a priest. To the poor multitude the earth was a kind of enchanted forest, full of demons ready to devour, and theological serpents lurking with infinite power to fascinate and torture the unhappy and impotent soul. Life to them was a dim and mysterious labyrinth, in which they wandered weary and lost, guided by priests as bewildered as themselves, without knowing that at every step 
the ariadne of reason offered them the long-lost clue the very heavens were full of death the lightning was regarded as the glittering vengeance of god and the earth was thick with snares for the unwary feet of man the soul was supposed to be crowded with the wild beasts of desire the heart to be totally corrupt prompting only to crime virtues were regarded as deadly sins in disguise there was a continual warfare being waged between the deity and the devil for the possession of every soul the latter generally being considered victorious the flood the tornado the volcano were all evidences of the displeasure of heaven and the sinfulness of man the blight that withered the frost that blackened the earthquake that devoured were the messengers of the creator the world was governed by fear against all the evils of nature there was known only the defense of prayer of fasting of credulity and devotion man in his helplessness endeavored to soften the heart of god the faces of the multitude were blanched with fear and wet with tears they were the prey of hypocrites kings and priests my heart bleeds when i contemplate the sufferings endured by the millions now dead of those who lived when the world appeared to be insane when the heavens were filled with an infinite horror who snatched babes with dimpled hands and rosy cheeks from the white breasts of mothers and dashed them into an abyss of eternal flame slowly beautifully like the coming of the dawn came the grand truth that the universe is governed by law that disease fastens itself upon the good and upon the bad that the tornado cannot be stopped by counting beads that the rushing lava pauses not for bended knees the lightning for clasped and uplifted hands nor the cruel waves of the sea for prayer that paying tides causes rather than prevents famine that pleasure is not sin that happiness is the only good that demons and gods exist only in the imagination that faith is a lullaby sung to put the soul to sleep that devotion is a bribe that fear offers to supposed power that offering rewards in another world for obedience in this is simply buying a soul on credit that knowledge consists in ascertaining the laws of nature and that wisdom is the science of happiness slowly grandly beautifully these things are dawning upon mankind from copernicus we learned that this earth is only a grain of sand on the infinite shore of the universe that everywhere we are surrounded by shining worlds vastly greater than our own all moving and existing in accordance with law true the earth began to grow small but man began to grow great the moment the fact was established that other worlds are governed by law it was only natural to conclude that our little world was also under its dominion the old theological method of accounting for physical phenomena by the pleasure and displeasure of the deity was by the intellectual abandoned they found that disease death life thought heat cold the seasons the winds the dreams of man the instinct of animals in short that all physical and mental phenomena are governed by law absolute eternal and inexorable let it be understood by the term law is meant the same invariable relations of succession and resemblance predicated of all facts springing from like conditions law is a fact not a cause it is a fact that like conditions produce like results this fact is law when we say that the universe is governed by law we mean that this fact called law is incapable of change that it is has been and forever will be the same inexorable immutable fact inseparable from all phenomena 
law in this sense was not enacted or made it could not have been otherwise than as it is that which necessarily exists has no creator only a few years ago this earth was considered the real center of the universe all the stars were supposed to revolve around this insignificant atom the german mind more than any other has done away with this piece of egotism Purbach and Mullerus, in the fifteenth century, contributed most to the advancement of astronomy in their day. To the latter, the world is indebted for the introduction of decimal fractions, which completed our arithmetical notation, and formed the second of the three steps by which, in modern times, the science of numbers has been so greatly improved and yet both of these men believed in the most childish absurdities, at least in enough of them to die without their orthodoxy having ever been questioned. Next came the great Copernicus, and he stands at the head of the heroic thinkers of his time, who had the courage and the mental strength to break the chains of prejudice, custom, and authority, and to establish truth on the basis of experience, observation, and reason. He removed the earth, so to speak, from the center of the universe, and ascribed to it a twofold motion, and demonstrated the true position which it occupies in the solar system. At his bidding the earth began to revolve. At the command of his genius it commenced its grand flight amid the eternal constellations around the sun. For fifty years his discoveries were disregarded. All at once, by the exertions of Galileo, they were kindled into so grand a conflagration as to consume the philosophy of Aristotle, to alarm the hierarchy of Rome, and to threaten the existence of every opinion not founded upon experience, observation, and reason. The earth was no longer considered a universe governed by the caprices of some revengeful deity who had made the stars out of what he had left after completing the world, and had stuck them in the sky simply to adorn the night. I have said this much concerning astronomy because it was the first splendid step forward, the first sublime blow that shattered the lance and shivered the shield of superstition the first real help that man received from heaven. Because it was the first great lever placed beneath the altar of a false religion, the first revelation of the infinite to man, the first authoritative declaration that the universe is governed by law, the first science that gave the lie direct to the cosmogony of barbarism, and because it is the sublimest victory that reason has achieved. In speaking of astronomy, I have confined myself to the discoveries made since the revival of learning. Long ago on the banks of the Ganges, ages before Copernicus lived, Aryabhata taught that the earth is a sphere and revolves on its own axis. This, however, does not detract from the glory of the great German. The discovery of the Hindu had been lost in the midnight of Europe, in the age of faith, and Copernicus was as much a discoverer as though Aryabhata had never lived. In this short address there is no time to speak of other sciences, and to point out the particular evidence furnished by each to establish the dominion of law nor to more than mention the names of descartes the first who undertook to give an explanation of the celestial motions or who formed the vast and philosophic conception of reducing all phenomena of the universe to the same law of montaigne one of the heroes of common sense of galvani whose experiments gave the telegraph to the world of voltaire who contributed more than any other of the sons of men to the destruction of religious intolerance of august comte whose genius erected to itself a monument that still touches the stars of gutenberg watt stevenson arkwright all soldiers of science in the grand army of the dead kings the glory of science is that it is freeing the soul, breaking the mental manacles, getting the brain out of bondage, giving courage to thought. 
filling the world with mercy, justice, and joy. Science found agriculture plowing with a stick, reaping with a sickle, commerce at the mercy of the treacherous waves and the inconstant winds, a world without books, without schools, man denying the authority of reason, employing his ingenuity in the manufacture of instruments of torture, in building inquisitions and cathedrals. It found the land filled with malicious monks, with persecuting Protestants and the burners of men. It found a world full of fear, ignorance on its knees, credulity the greatest virtue. Women treated like beasts of burden, cruelty the only means of reformation. It found the world at the mercy of disease and famine, men trying to read their fates in the stars and to tell their fortunes by signs and wonders, generals thinking to conquer their enemies by making the sign of the cross or by telling a rosary. It found all history full of petty and ridiculous falsehood, and the Almighty was supposed to spend most of his time turning sticks into snakes, drowning boys for swimming on Sunday, and killing little children for the purpose of converting their parents. It found the earth filled with slaves and tyrants. The people in all countries downtrodden, half naked, half starved, without hope, and without reason in the world. Such was the condition of man when the morning of science dawned upon his brain, and before he had heard the sublime declaration that the universe is governed by law. For the change that has taken place we are indebted solely to science, the only lever capable of raising mankind. Abject faith is barbarism. Reason is civilization. To obey is slavish. To act from a sense of obligation perceived by the reason is noble. Ignorance worships mystery. Reason explains it. The one grovels, the other soars. No wonder that fable is the enemy of knowledge. A man with a false diamond shuns the society of lapidaries, and it is upon this principle that superstition abhors science. In all ages the people have honored those who dishonored them. They have worshipped their destroyers. They have canonized the most gigantic liars and buried the great thieves in marble and gold. Under the loftiest monuments sleep the dust of murder. Imposture has always worn a crown. The world is beginning to change because the people are beginning to think. To think is to advance. Everywhere the great minds are investigating the creeds and the superstitions of men, the phenomena of nature and the laws of things. At the head of this great army of investigators stood Humboldt, the serene leader of an intellectual host, a king by the suffrage of science and the divine right of genius. And today we are not honoring some butcher called a soldier, some wily politician called a statesman, some robber called a king, nor some malicious metaphysician called a saint. We are honoring the grand Humboldt, whose victories were all achieved in the arena of thought, who destroyed prejudice, ignorance, and error, not men, who shed light, not blood, and who contributed to the knowledge, the wealth, and the happiness of all mankind. His life was pure, his aims lofty, his learning varied and profound, and his achievements vast. We honor him because he has ennobled our race, because he has contributed as much as any man, living or dead, to the real prosperity of the world. We honor him because he honored us, because he labored for others, because he was the most learned man of the most learned nation, because he left a legacy of glory to every human being. For these reasons he is honored throughout the world. Millions are doing homage to his genius at this moment, 
and millions are pronouncing his name with reverence and recounting what he accomplished we associate the name of humboldt with oceans continents mountains and volcanoes with the great plains the wide deserts the snow-lipped craters of the andes with primeval forests and european capitals with wildernesses and universities with savages and savants with the lonely rivers of unpeopled wastes with the peaks and pampas and steppes and cliffs and crags with the progress of the world with every science known to man and with every star glittering in the immensity of space humboldt adopted none of the soul-shrinking creeds of his day wasted none of his time in the stupidities inanities and contradictions of theological metaphysics he did not endeavor to harmonize the astronomy and geology of a barbarous people with the science of the nineteenth century never for one moment did he abandon the sublime standard of truth he investigated he studied he thought he separated the gold from the dross in the crucible of his grand brain he was never found on his knees before the altar of superstition he stood erect by the grand tranquil column of reason he was an admirer a lover an adorer of nature and at the age of ninety bowed by the weight of nearly a century covered with the insignia of honor loved by a nation respected by a world with kings for his servants he laid his weary head upon her bosom upon the bosom of the universal mother and with her loving arms around him sank into that slumber called death history added another name to the starry scroll of the immortals the world is his monument upon the eternal granite of her hills he inscribed his name and there upon everlasting stone his genius wrote this the sublimest of truths the universe is governed by law end of ingersoll's lecture on humboldt this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during May 2007.